All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for coming to my talk. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here and give this talk. And I uh, thank Bumadin and, and all the organizers uh, for their kind invitation and coordination. So uh, apology that I couldn't be here in person. Um, I accepted um, some invitation to Siam uh, without realizing that it's actually um, gonna be the same time. So I really apologize and the loss is mine. Uh, but anyway, I'm still glad to be here and talk about steeple optimization. So, um, so if any of you have heard me talking about um, another work, which is uh, optimization on lead groups, uh, this, this work that I'm talking about now is actually new, and uh, I will explain the difference. So first of all, let me, let me talk about uh, what is the steeple manifold and why do we want to optimize on it? Uh, by optimize on it, I meant um, optimize the function that is defined on the steeple manifold. So uh, the steeple manifold can be viewed as a collection of matrices that are basically uh, orthogonal. But importantly, uh, we are actually considering n by n matrices, so tall matrices, and uh, we basically require each column to be orthonormal to all the other columns. And uh, of course, if m is equal to n, then we, have, we actually have a degenerate case. We have a special case that is the orthogonal group. So in this situation, you actually have a group structure, which allows you to, to do many, many fancy things. Uh, but in general, when n is not equal to m, this is not a group. So the problem is actually harder. Uh, why do I want to optimize a function uh, defined on, on steeple manifold? So here is a simple example, just, just for illustration. Um, so it's called the leading eigenvalue problem. So you are given a very big matrix A, so n by n. And uh, in a lot of situations, uh, you know, even though this is a very simple problem, uh, it plays an important role in data sciences. And uh, in a lot of situations, you want only the largest m eigenvalues. And uh, sometimes, for example, n could be like a million or even bigger, and m could, could just be like 10. So if you think about this, uh, computationally, it's, it's rather challenging. But uh, in fact, you can formulate it as an optimization problem and, and use that to, to solve the problem um, iteratively. So, uh, so how this works. So you can actually uh, pick an element on steeple manifold denoted by x. OK, so it basically contains orthonormal uh, columns and therefore orthonormal basis of a subspace. And then you can actually use this x to project uh, the whole matrix to the uh, to 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 this subspace, and uh, and then if you take the trace of the corresponding smaller matrix, you are basically summing up the eigenvalues uh, in the subspace. So so of course, if you maximize this quantity over all possible subspaces, you will find the best subspace uh, to which the projection is actually uh, giving you the largest eigenvalues. Okay, so that's why. Uh, you know, the, the whole problem can be actually formulated as a, as a Riemannian optimization problem. Uh, one thing that uh, we, should, we should notice is that uh, you don't want to actually do this optimization uh, in, a, in an approximate way. You need your solution to be exactly on a steeple manifold because you need, subs you need actually the basis, the, 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 the exact orthonormal basis of, of this subspace. Uh, so, oh, uh, yeah. So, uh, so you may, so, so some of some of you may may say, okay, so that's that's great, but this problem is too easy because it's minimizing a quadratic function. Well, that's actually uh, not true because uh, the space is actually curved, and uh, and therefore this is not even a convex problem. This is not even a convex optimization problem. But uh, but if you still think it's easy, uh, here is something uh, that is that is even more um, intriguing. So, uh, so here's a second example called projection robust Wasserstein distance. And uh, so uh, it's basically a notion invented to improve some computational challenges uh, faced with, uh, one faces when, when computing something called Wasserstein distance. So what, what is Wasserstein distance? So uh, it's basically a way to measure the distance between two probability measures. So suppose you have two probability measures, mu and nu, and uh, uh, you can define uh, something called a Wasserstein distance, uh, also known as, um, uh, as sand moving distance. So what happens is that uh, you, can, you can view the first distribution mu as a pile of sand, 
uh, you know, described by the density and a new is another pi of sand. So you basically want to move the first pi of sand into the shape of the second pi of sand while minimizing sort of like your effort. So, so the distance uh, uh, in which each, each sand travels. So, uh, so one way to do it is to use uh, this Cantorovich formulation in which you basically uh, look for something called a coupling uh, denoted by small pi, which is just a, you know, a, a, a joint distribution between pi and nu, but a joint distribution between x and y such that the projection to the x variable of pi gives you mu and the projection uh, in the y variable gives you nu. And then you can basically minimize this, uh, this, this function uh, uh, to actually get the optimal transport plan, uh, which, which gives you also the Wasserstein two distance. Okay, so uh, if, you, if you haven't seen this before, I apologize, I, I was very fast. Um, but uh, one thing that I want you to, to believe me about uh, is that this quantity is very costly to compute if you have a very high dimensional problem. So, um, so in fact, uh, that's why a lot of efforts have been, have been uh, put into how to improve uh, various calculations, et cetera. So in fact, a group of very brilliant researchers um, have proposed this notion called projection robust washes and distance. So the idea is that in data sciences, you might want to characterize probability distributions, but, uh, but actually the very special ones, for example. So your data may actually be in very high dimensional space, but in fact, they may actually admit some low dimensional structure. So, so the data may actually be mostly centered around a, a low dimensional manifold or even a, a low dimensional subspace in high dimensional space. So, so therefore, uh, maybe what you want to do is you actually want to look for a projection of the high dimensional distribution uh, to a low dimensional distribution. And um, suppose you have your projection, you can actually show, you can prove that the, pro, uh, you know, the, the, the Wasserstein distance between the projected distribution is given by, uh, by the inner term that I have here. Uh, and then of course you have to look for the best subspace in which, in which you, you project everything. And if you do that, you can you can basically get this uh, this max mean problem, and uh, of course this is a this is a steeple manifold optimization problem because at the outside you you maximize over a function uh, a, um, over an, a, a variable defined on the steeple manifold, and uh, this is this is computationally more manageable uh, if actually m, which is the dimension of your projected space, is much smaller than n. And moreover, this is actually claimed to be robust because I mean, so, so suppose your data really have low dimensional structure and, uh, and then maybe you have some outliers. If you compare, if you compare the whole data distributions using Washington distance, the outliers will be actually accounted for as well. But, uh, but if you believe there's a low dimensional structure and you first do this projection, uh, the outliers may actually already be deleted. Uh, so, so therefore, this is also ro more robust. But again, you have to do exact uh, maximization on the manifold. You cannot be slightly off uh, from the manifold. Okay. So, uh, finally, a third, a third application, a, th a third reason that we do this uh, is for improving transformers. So, uh, so what is transformer? So, in a nutshell, a transformer is a is a recent machine learning architecture that is extremely powerful. And recent is relative, recent is something relative. I mean, in applied math time scale, this is recent, but in machine learning time scale, this is already like um, uh, um, a century ago because, because now this thing really like uh, sweeps the entire field. And, uh, and in fact, it was first invented for, for natural language processing. So, so it deals with sequences. But now uh, it, it also uh, more or less dominates computer vision as well. So it's good because it has basically uh, something called infinite attention span. So recurrent neural network has a short right reference time window. So, uh, so that is why people invented things like LSTM and GRU to have a longer reference window. But attention mechanism has infinite time window. And by the way, I got this nice illustration 
uh, from the blog of Michael Bai, so uh, I'm thankful. Uh, so the way attention works, uh, so the way transformer works is that it has something called multi-headed attention layer. And uh, um, what this multi-headed attention layer does is it tries to characterize the interactions between words in your sentence. And the interactions can be actually uh, arbitrarily long distance. So, um, so mathematically, uh, that corresponds to the fact that each attention head has trainable parameters that are, that are matrices. And uh, even though people are still trying to understand uh, exactly how attention works, uh, roughly speaking, these weight matrices actually uh, encode interactions between words. But of course, you know, you don't have these interactions known a priori, so you have you actually have to train your model. So you actually have to optimize functions uh, that functions of these weight matrices in order to learn the interactions from from the training data. And then we ask ourselves, okay, so because these matrices characterize interactions, um, you know, if uh, you have non orthonormal columns. That means actually, you know, interactions are actually somehow redundant. So, uh, so is there a way? Uh, can we actually make these matrices to be to be orthogonal so that uh, my attention mechanism is more efficient? And uh, so that's that's what we try. So, uh, so we used our uh, Stifo optimizer. We we basically enforce. We basically enforce these matrices to be to be uh, on a stable manifold, and we actually tried a new model on a vision transformer, and uh, and then it turns out that uh, you know we don't have to do anything extra. Once we add orthogonality, we can we can get performance that is much much better than the original version, the Euclidean version, and moreover. Uh, you know, vision transformer is something that is so important. I, I think it's cited like thousands of times, uh, even though it's just the two years old. Uh, so a lot of later models have been proposed. Uh, they are very fancy, very powerful. Uh, but, uh, you know, if we just uh, just don't read the literature, which would be a terrible thing, um, but, but just add orthogonality to the original version, we can actually, uh, you know, outperform many of the later fancier models. Uh, but uh, but uh, you know this comes with uh, something uh, some care. So we have to actually train by our optimizers. There are existing Stifo optimizers. Some, for example, don't have momentum, etc. So uh, so so they don't respect the orthogonality as as much as we do. And therefore, you may actually get a performance that uh, that do not actually exceed uh, the original version. So hopefully I gave enough motivation about why we want to optimize our steeple manifold. Uh, the question now is, is how we do it. Um, so we will be actually using a variation approach because even though the problem seems, seems to be innocent, uh, f is really a function defined on a manifold. So uh, by using a variation approach, we will get um, uh, uh, you know, treatment that is uh, intrinsically friendly to non-Euclidean spaces, and also uh, a notion called momentum will be naturally introduced. So let me explain what is momentum and, and why it is helpful. So momentum is, is of course, a notion uh, that comes from mechanics. And uh, mechanics, of course, uh, started with Newton. And uh, so Newton said, uh, the rate of change of momentum, of physical momentum, is given by the force. So you can write down, uh, you know, the definition of momentum. So it's basically mass times uh, velocity. And then you can write down Newton's equation as, uh, you know, P dot being given by a force. And if you are in a conservative setup and, and you take F as your potential, uh, then negative uh, gradient of F is going to be actually your, your conservative force. And then Lagrange came along. Lagrange said, okay, so, so that's great, but you can also consider a variational principle uh, in which you define an action functional. So it's a function of function. So S is a function of Q. Q is a function of time indicating basically your motion uh, uh, of particle as a, as a function of, of time. And if you define the action to be the integral of something called a Lagrangian, 
uh, which is evaluated along the path. Then if you choose your Lagrangian to be kinetic energy minus the potential energy, you can show that the critical point of this variational principle known as Euler Lagrange equation is exactly Newton's equation. Okay, so this is in some sense the generalization uh, of Newton's, Newton's law. Um, but of course you may ask, how is this relevant to optimization? So, so far there's no relevance. Uh, the reason is because, okay, so your Lagrangian here is actually independent uh, of time explicitly. So you have a time translational symmetry and correspondingly you have, a, you have a conservation law. So the total energy of the system, so kinetic energy plus potential energy is gonna be a conserved quantity. And therefore, uh, you know, if you run the dynamics, you will see basically a constant exchange between the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So F will not be minimized. However, that's really because you have time independence of the Lagrangian. So uh, Vipisono, Wilson, and Jordan uh, had this beautiful paper uh, in which they actually introduced an explicit time dependence to break the time translational symmetry. So if you multiply the previous Lagrangian by uh, some known function of time, and then you write down the Lagrangian, Euler Lagrangian equation again, you get basically something like this. So, so if I rewrite it as a first order system, uh, there is basically an additional term. So, so P dot is still gonna be given by the net force, but there are really two forces. One is a conservative force. Uh, the other is actually a frictional force. So because of that, uh, you, know, you are actually continuously uh, removing energy from the system. So it's very easy to prove that as time goes to infinity, Q actually converges to a local minimizer of F. Uh, so that's guaranteed, e even though your F can be highly non-convex. Uh, and how is this helpful to optimization? Well, so, uh, so if you pick uh, gamma, this friction coefficient to be three over T, uh, and you can do that, you can basically get arbitrary gamma because you can, you can assign this R. Uh, and then you discretize this ODE system in, in some particular way you actually recover a celebrated method in the, in the optimization uh, uh, community called Nesterov accelerated gradient for convex functions. And uh, if you choose gamma to be a constant, on the other hand, then one discretization gives you another member of the Nesterov family, uh, this time Nesterov accelerated gradient for strongly convex functions. And uh, another discretization gives you something that is also famous, it's called heavy ball. Uh, and all these should be contrasted with gradient descent, which is a forward Euler discretization of gradient flow or the E. And notice that there, there's no momentum uh, in gradient descent or gradient flow. Uh, so, so what we have on the left, on the other hand, have momentum. And, uh, and that creates a, a big difference. For example, so in, in an AGC, C actually means convex. So, uh, so if your loss function is convex, and, uh, and then you can prove that the, the speed of convergence of NAGC is like one over K squared. And if you compare that to, to gradient descent, uh, whose rate is one over K, you see much faster convergence. Okay, so this is one of the reasons that people say that momentum actually gives you acceleration. So you, you get better optimization, um, which is desirable. Um, and now, uh, now, of course, everything was just the, you know, the, the existing great work. Uh, what we want to do is to, to generalize everything to Riemannian manifold. Uh, if you actually stare at the differential equation, uh, you, you will actually see it's not, it's not very easy to do this generalization, let alone later on, you have to discretize the dynamics. So that is why we don't start with a differential equation. We actually start with a variational principle. Okay, so. Um, so in fact, to, to just give, give, give you a glimpse of why Riemannian optimization is non-trivial. So suppose you just, just stare at the, the differential equation, you want to use the gradient somewhere uh, to actually do a, construct a minimization dynamics. Then you should first ask yourself, what is a gradient? Uh, so here is a known example. So if you consider two by two orthogonal matrices, and pick a special objective function that is the determinant of the corresponding matrix. 
And then uh, some careless person may say, oh, then that's easy. You just compute the determinant and then you collect all the partial derivatives to form the, to form the gradient. Uh, that's incorrect because on, on you know, the two by two orthogonal matrix, the determinant is always gonna be one or, or, or well, plus or minus one, but on each connecting branch, uh, it's actually a constant. So the gradient is actually gonna be zero. So what is going on? The reason is because the Stiefel manifold uh, is really in this case, just a one dimensional manifold. It's, it's not four. You, you have an orthogonality constraint, which eliminates uh, your variables. So A, B, C, D are actually not, depend, not independent from each other, which means you cannot just collect partial derivatives pretending that uh, they are independent from each other. Okay, so that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. So, so manifold optimization is a profound field. I would say that uh, the case without momentum is, is more or less very well understood. Uh, what we are doing here is to add momentum and, uh, and as a consequence, and, and in fact, a lot of extra care as well, uh, we get very good speed and, and also very good accuracy of the resulting output. So that's, that's what new, what, what's new here. So uh, to do this, um, like I said, we started with the variational principle. So, uh, so I said the variational principle naturally extends to Riemannian manifold. And uh, here is how it works. So suppose now instead of a Euclidean situation in which your Q moves in just the n-dimensional space, now uh, your, uh, your trajectory, which I intentionally denoted by G instead of Q, is moving on a curved space. But G dot is, is, is still in the tangent. So you can actually leverage the Riemannian structure to define a kinetic energy. So you can just replace the kinetic energy that you had before and everything else is gonna be the same. And then you do the variational principle. And uh, in theory, you, you can get Euler-Lagrange equation and uh, that, ODE will give you dynamics that optimizes your objective function. Uh, in practice, the ODE is already not going to be not very explicit. And if you discretize, that's gonna actually be a nightmare. Uh, so, so that is why, you know, in special cases, so, so we actually consider the, the, the case when G is a, is a group and we leverage on the group structure um, uh, so there is some technique uh, called reduction while trivialization. I will not talk about it, uh, but basically, you know, in this case, you can actually get something explicit uh, and, and therefore a real algorithm. Uh, however, uh, you know, if we, we talk about Stiefel manifolds, you lose this group structure. So this approach doesn't work. So that's why we will actually do, um, do extra work. Uh, so now we uh, we had a variational principle, but but in fact we will we will massage it into something else to to actually overcome the difficulty. So like I said previously, you just define your Lagrangian to be like this, and then and then you do a variational principle. But in fact, a lot of details uh, were hidden under the rug. In particular, what uh, what in what space do you do the variation? So. So you, you, in fact, uh, do the variation in a constrained space of functions. That's because you require X to be in the Stiefel manifold. And uh, as a consequence, X dot has to be in the tangent space. So overall, your paths ha have to actually be at, at any time point on this uh, tangent bundle. So that's going to create a lot of difficulty because this function space is highly nonlinear. So that is yeah, why- Sorry, just to note, you have five minutes, yeah? Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. That's why uh, we introduced a new variation approach. So we actually add a Lagrange multiplier term. So this is a function, function Lagrange multiplier because lambda is a function of time. And, uh, and we basically add this additional term in the variation of in the Lagrangian to enforce that the constraint is actually satisfied for all time. Uh, and then we can do the variation in unconstrained functional space. Okay, so, so now X is just a, uh, a time-dependent function that takes values in, in just n by n matrices. Uh, to be honest, there, there is another uh, important detail, which is lambda. So, so it seems you have to pay some price. So the, you don't know this, this function Lagrange multiplier, a priori, but we actually have techniques to actually figure out its value uh, in terms of x. So by the end of the day, you can actually get explicit ODE uh, that sort of minimizes this 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 action functional uh, in Euclidean uh, and the ODE is defined in Euclidean space. So to give you a little more details, um, 
So uh, now, uh, I, because I, I want to show you something concrete, I have to pick a metric. So uh, if I pick a metric to be uh, given by a metric tensor, given by, by some matrix like this, um, then I can actually write down the ODE. And by the way, uh, so this is actually a family of metrics. The literature only considers the case when A is equal to zero or a half, but we can, we can be more general. Uh, and then, you know, you work out, you do some hard work, and then you can, you can write down the corresponding Euler-Lagrange equation, which is the set, the set of ODEs that look like this. Okay, so it, it looks complicated, but, uh, but what is cool about it is that everything is actually um, in Euclidean space. So X is just an N by N matrix. Q is another N by N matrix. What we have here, so you need the gradient somewhere, but in fact, what we have here is just the Euclidean derivative. So, okay, so, so th this is when you pretend that all the, all the elements of X are independent from each other. And then you just collect all the partial derivatives. And then, you know, you just use this to evolve your dynamics. And uh, everything is Euclidean, but in fact, uh, you know, the solution will be automatically staying on the manifold. So you don't have to do anything, any extra care. Uh, the dynamics automatically uh, gives you the manifold structure. Uh, and by the way, a reminder of the manifold structure is that X has to be orthonormal and the Q has to, to be in the tangent space, which you can work out to, to give you uh, this, this nonlinear construct. And also the dynamics is guaranteed uh, to converge to a local minimizer. Okay, so so uh, I'm almost down. So in fact, you know, the, there is the hardest part and, and the, 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 the most um, uh, uh, innovative part uh, of, of the talk, but it's technical. So let me quickly go through it. So, uh, so at this moment, you may think, you know, great job, or, or you may think this is garbage because this is, this is just a continuous dynamics in continuous time. It's not an algorithm. So we have to numerically integrate this system. Okay, so, uh, so we have to discretize the time in order to actually get an algorithm. But, uh, but, but you know, one requirement we want is, is that uh, we want after discretization for X and Q to still stay exactly on the manifold. And moreover, we actually want our discretization to be explicit and we want it to be efficient. So for example, the matrices are N by N. So if you have complexity that depends on, on N, that's good. If it depends on n, that's bad. And uh, in manifold optimization, things uh, like exponential maps uh, are frequently used to, 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 to actually you know, allow you to stay on the manifold. That's computationally expensive. We don't want it either. There is something called Cayley transform that, uh, that is uh, an approximation of, of exponential map for orthogonal matrices. That's also computationally expensive. We don't want it either. So, so altogether, if you want to preserve the structure but, but be cheap on the computation, this is a very highly non-trivial problem. Uh, so we do have a technical solution, uh, which is non-trivial. So let me just say you, you first have to use the geometric decomposition of the momentum variable. Uh, and then you, know, you have to write down new dynamics for the new variables. And then you have to discretize this dynamics. So the traditional operator, operator splitting won't work. Uh, won't be enough either. So uh, we have to do something extra. Uh, but by the end of the day, um, by the end of the day, you can actually get a, a method that preserves all the manifold structure without using expensive operations. And, uh, uh, and it's great. And, um, and we also can actually extend that to adaptive time stepping. But again, it's technical. So uh, so I'd rather stop here, but this is basically how we can get great performance on transformers, et cetera. So let me summarize. Uh, so so uh, we use a variational principle to do optimization on manifold. Uh, that's, that's actually not easy to handle. So we actually turn this variational principle to a new variational principle uh, that is constrained, but defined on the Euclidean space. And then, uh, and then we get continuous dynamics that, that does optimization um, on the on the Euclidean space, but in fact, you know, you know, under the surface, it actually does optimization on the manifold as well. It stays exactly on the manifold, and uh, then really the hardest part is to do structure preserving discretization of the dynamics, and we did it. And as a consequence, 
we get accurate and efficient gradient descent uh, with momentum uh, for, op for optimizing functions defined on the Stiefel manual. Okay, so uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention and feedback.